We're continuing our sermon about the words of God and looking at this passage in Deuteronomy where we're taught that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word, every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is where we get our living, where we're able to, um, how we're able to stay alive. So this, uh, the title of this morning's sermon is Living by God's Words. And I don't want this to be thought of in the way as like some people live their life by a certain motto or they live their life by a credo. But I want us to, th to think of this as we, this is how we, are, we live by eating and breathing, right? And in that way, we live by God's words. God's words gives us true life. Um, there's a, just a little verse at the end of 1 Timothy, the letter to Timothy, where um, he's instructing people to do good, be rich in good works, be generous and ready to share, and thus storing up for yourselves treasures as a good foundation for the future so that you may be able to take hold of that which is truly life. So in that, that little passage there, he talks about, he just presents this idea of something, there's life, but then there is truly life. And he's talking to wealthy people in that particular part of the letter, where he's saying, so these wealthy people, they have, they have everything, but he gave them instructions so that they might store for themselves a foundation for the future, so they can take hold of that which is truly life. And we can only take hold of that which is truly life as we live by God's words. And I think that's what he's talking about, living by every word that comes from the mouth of God, that which is truly life. I think we really need to adjust our, our thinking in what it means to live and what the Bible refers to as life. And so we look to God's word for life. Last week I was having a conversation with one of my little boys. He asked if he could have a a second glass of pop. I said, sure, you can have half a glass. And he poured it carefully, and he did a good job of that. And then I was a little surprised. That he just, like, drank it as fast as he could, and he was done. And then he leaves the room for a minute, and then he comes back. And he goes, oh, my stomach doesn't feel good. <laughs> and I said, well, that's what happens when you drink pop as fast as you possibly can. It was, like, real fast. And he goes, no, no, that's not it. And he started explaining to me something else. <laughs> And the thought that came to my head, I said, what makes you think you know more about life than me? <laughs> it's like, I've had so much more life than you. I, I know more, all right? I, I get what happens when you drink pop real fast. And he had an answer for that, why he thinks he knows more about life than me. <laughs> and I think we need to approach God's word in that way, that God knows more about life than we do, obviously. So we need to listen to him. We need to stop disagreeing with him. Uh, we need to not take lightly the words that he has given to us because he knows more about life than we do. But it's not just that. I think that's a great place to start, and many of us need to get to that place. But we need to see more than just he knows more than us, but he is the source of all life, and he is giving us true life. And how does he give us true life? It's through words written down. Um, I can, you know, people wrote down their messages on the, the slips of paper for their prayer requests. And that was a way for them to take what was on their hearts and in their minds and transfer it, transfer it from their heart and mind to my mind with the hope that it would get down into my heart. They communicated something from them to me through written word. And that's what God's doing. But God is the source of all life, and he has chosen to transfer true life to us through his words. So we need to be looking at these and considering what does it mean to have life by his word. This also was in, in, impressed to me as I've been studying Psalm 119. Many times in that psalm, the psalmist, who is probably David, says, give me life. He asks for life. So here he is, the king of Israel, and he's asking for life. So that shows us there's something more to life than what we think about it. And I think this is what, what God is teaching us from his word. Now, we're just looking at these three verses in Deuteronomy, verses 1, 2, and 3. And 
some people may think, okay, why are we looking at Deuteronomy to, be, to hear from God's word? Aren't there better places to go? Well, Jesus went to this very passage, and we're going to look at that. Jesus thought this is a good passage to teach. And I think it's, it's an excellent passage, and it's an excellent opportunity to see how um, the Bible interprets itself. The safest way and the, the, um, the most secure way to, tra- to interpret the Bible is to let the Bible interpret itself. You can come to some passages that are hard to understand. And uh, I hope that as I go through this sermon, you'll see what that means to let the Bible interpret itself. And uh, that I think we'll see that today as we look at these three verses. So first we'll look at verse 1, where it says, where, where Moses is speaking to the children of Israel. He says, The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And so here, Moses is giving this charge to the children of Israel. And to give you the context of where this is, we're in Deuteronomy 8. Uh, the, the, the children of Israel, remember they left Egypt. They were, they were enslaved in Egypt. And God delivered them out of Egypt. And then they, they, God had prepared for them a promised land That would be their own land, their own possession, their own inheritance. And now, at the reading here, they are south of that promised land. They're they're south of it, and then they're going to go up and to the east of the Jordan River and then cross the Jordan River and go into the land. But they're just to the east of it, and uh, that's where the the book of Deuteronomy starts. And then Moses kind of gives them a synopsis of everything that happened from Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai up to the place where they're at right now where they're hearing this charge. He he recounts their history, and uh, he also repeats the Ten Commandments. He tells them the story of how they received the Ten Commandments. The people that Moses is talking to were not the same generation that left Egypt. An entire generation died and and a new one raised up. So he's telling them things that their parents experienced. Their parents were the ones that uh, um, heard uh, the Ten Commandments originally. And so he's recounting the Ten Commandments. And then following that chapter, he gives them the greatest commandment that Jesus called the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then he gives them this charge that we just read. And then he gives more laws. And then they renew the covenant, say, all right, you, you agree to this covenant? Yes, we have life by this covenant, we'll do it. And then Joshua is commissioned to be the new leader of Israel, and then Moses dies at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And then the next part of the story is Israel, they do go up, and they go into the inheritance, and they receive the land. But they're, they're given this charge, the whole command that I command you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. So they were given this, but this command is qualified. Look over in chapter 9, verse 5. They are told they need to do these things. They need to be righteous. They need to follow God's laws and God's rules. But in verse, chapter 9, verse 5, it says, Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart, Are you going in to possess their land? But because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you, and and that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So that's an important truth here, that we are told to obey the commands of God. The whole commandment that we, we receive we got to be careful to do, but it's not by our righteousness or the uprightness of our heart that we receive the good things from the Lord. And he says it's not because of that, but because of their wickedness, I want to drive them out, but also to, to confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers. And we're in that same position. 
that we don't receive an inheritance from God because of our righteousness at all. Although we are commanded to be righteous and pursue it, we don't receive anything because of that righteousness. But rather, just like this, because of the wor- to confirm the word that the Lord swore to the fathers long ago. We receive anything good because of God's promise. That's what they're saying here. He's saying it's because of God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why you're getting the land. And it's the same for us. We receive an inheritance because of God's promise, not because of our righteousness. But this command still stands. We need to take the whole command of God and be careful to do it. He continues the charge in verse 2. He says, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he's t- he reminds them, don't forget, you need to remember that you wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. You need to remember that you were humbled, that you were tested. Don't forget the testing. Don't forget the humbling, wandering in the wilderness. Now, if you have your Bible, flip just to the very first chapter of Deuteronomy. The thing that leads up to this, it says in verse 2, it is 11 days journey from Mount Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. That's where they are, Kadesh Barnea. It's an 11-day journey from Mount Sinai to that spot, Mount Horeb to that spot. And then verse 3, in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, 40 years and 11 months, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had commanded him. So it was an 11-day journey, but it took them 40 years. And if you're familiar with the book of Exodus, it's because they sinned. And they were afraid to go into the, they were afraid to receive the inheritance that God had given them. And they were unwilling to do it. So God said, all right, you won't get it. This whole generation is going to pass away. Your children will get it. The children you were afraid were going to get consumed in that promised land, they're going to be the inheritors. And so even though it was an 11-day journey, they spent 40 years journeying in that wilderness until they arrived. And God is telling, Moses is telling these people, remember those 40 years that God humbled you. And what does this have to do with us? I'm glad we didn't get humbled in that way, right? I'm glad we don't have to be sojourners wandering around, waiting for the promised land. Turn to Psalm 119, verse 19, if, you, if you'd like to. This is, like I said, probably written by King David. Psalm 119, verse 19, he says, I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. So here he is, the king of Israel. Now this may have been, there there was a time where he was in a wilderness as well, fleeing from Solomon, or from King Saul. Uh, But this this is a theme that happens enough in the Bible and in the Psalms that is surely not just when he was fleeing. But this idea that if the king of Israel, the king of God's chosen nation, the anointed one who wrote a good portion of the Bible, if he had not yet arrived in the promised land, then who has? Right? He was there in the promised land. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, if you would. Hebrews Chapter 4, in verse 8, the New Testament writer reflects on this same idea. This New Testament writer is reflecting on the idea that a psalmist would refer to the children of Israel going into the promised land, which is what we just looked at. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8, it says, For, if and he's saying this because he just quotes some of the psalms, and he says, For, If Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. Because remember, Joshua is the one that's going to bring them into the promised land. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, God would not have spoken of another day later on. And he's talking about the psalmist saying, 
I'm just a sojourner. I've got something else I'm looking forward to. The psalmist wrote it, and the writer of Hebrews said, that was God saying, there's another day later on. There's another day where you will find your rest, not in that promised land. Joshua did bring them into the promised land. They inherited cities that they didn't build, vineyards they didn't plant. They had all the kingdom. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, but that wasn't the rest God was talking about. And so we, we look at, we put together what the writer of Hebrews said, what David said in the Psalms, and we realize we need to have this same mind frame, that we are sojourners on this earth. We're not looking for this place to meet our expectations. This life is the test. This life is being a sojourner and testing us to see if we will obey God's commands. So if, if the psalmist uh, referred to this wandering in the wilderness and said this, me too, I am a wanderer as well. I'm a sojourner waiting for the promised land. Let's go back up to verse uh, 1 and see how that also might relate to us. When we look at verse 1, he says, Keep all these commands so that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land. How, how, do, th how do these verses, how should we interpret these verses by the rest of scriptures? Well, I mentioned 1 Timothy 16 that talks about that which is truly life. So we could apply that to this idea that you may live, that you may truly live. We need to be following God's commands so that we may truly live. And by the way, it is impossible for us to follow God's commands until we've been born again, until we've been given a new heart. This old heart can't do it. It's too high of a standard. But when God gives us a new heart, we are able to keep, keep God's commands. And we're going to be looking into that next week. But partly... This idea of um, that you may live, that you may have life that is truly life. Let's look and see what Jesus talked about true life. And we can see this in John chapter 6, verse 48. The Gospel of John. Chapter 6. This idea of keeping God's commands after having been given a new heart so that we may live Chapter 6, verse 48, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that no one may eat of it and not die, or so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And to talk about him giving his flesh takes us straight to the cross where he gave his flesh for the sins of the world, where he was offered as a sacrifice. And so Jesus is saying, the Israelites, your fathers, they ate the bread, the, this miraculous food of angels is what one of the psalmists calls it. It's bread from heaven. It was, it was miraculous food, but even they died. You need something better than that. There's life and then there's true life. And if we listen to this command in Deuteronomy 8.1, if this whole commandment that God gives us, if we're careful to do it, then we may have this true life, the whole commandment of God, right? Not just parts of it that appeal to us and not just parts that we understand the easiest, but the whole command. Jesus said that Moses talked about Jesus. And here in this passage we read in John 6, Jesus said, I'm the true bread that gives true life. And so even Moses was looking ahead to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, who would come from God, from heaven, to give true life. And so we need to, when we read this command in Deuteronomy 8, we don't dismiss it and say, oh, that's Old Covenant. We say, what is the whole commandment of God? It points us to the cross of Jesus and the other commandments as well. Um, we're going to look at we're going to get to verse three in Deuteronomy eight. And we're going to see about true life there as well. But let's think about this idea of multiplying. He says that you may live and multiply. And the the most recent fulfillment of this this promise was that the children of Israel would multiply and grow and become a great nation. And they did. But do we have this promise? Can we look to this and say, OK, if I'm careful to obey all of God's word, 
then I won't have any infer infertility problems. Uh, my, my children will, will have more and more children. We'll have a huge family. I don't think that's what we, how we should look at this. And I think whenever we look at multiplication, we need to think of spiritual multiplication. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus' final words before his ascension, he says, Matthew 28, verse 19, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So here we've got the same similar command of all that God commands, the whole command of God. He says, go and make other people like that. You go and multiply followers of Jesus. And this, this is also seen when you look at Paul's epistles. He calls both Titus and Timothy his true son in the faith. He calls uh, Timothy his true son four times, four different passages. He says, Timothy, my true son, right? Our children is how we multiply. And Paul said, I've got a true son, this convert, this man who is also a follower of Jesus and a pastor, someone who is multiplied from me someone not just someone who is like me but now there's two of us not just one now there's two of us and so um paul talks about having true children so i think we can apply this to this idea of being able to multiply if we're careful to obey god's commands and also the apostle john in his his epistle multiple times he calls his church my little children he calls them his children and he's taking this idea of if we follow God's commands, we'll have true life and we will multiply. We'll make more followers of Jesus, children uh, that will last for all of eternity. And this idea to go in and possess the land. What could we Christians, we followers of Jesus, learn from this? What, how do we obey this? How do we hope in this? If the instruction is keep all of God's commands so this will happen, what are we supposed to be expecting will happen? Let's look at a couple passages. Uh, we'll turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 talks about an inheritance. But also Jesus mentioned it in the, uh, in the Beatitudes. The first, the, first and the, second, uh, the first and the third Beatitude, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. And then the third one, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So Jesus is talking about an inheritance. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 11, we read, In Jesus, we, now remember, this is Paul's letter to people who are not the children of Israel. In Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So that sounds similar to the children of Israel. They were supposed to be to the praise of God's glory. They were supposed to show the glory of God in their inheritance. Verse 13, In Jesus you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So Moses is talking about inheritance. Be sure you keep all the commands of God so you can live and multiply and go in and possess the inheritance. And here Paul is saying, at the very least we can learn that when we believe the gospel, what he talked about here, the gospel of your salvation, we were given the Holy Spirit as a seal until we receive the inheritance. So we have not received it yet until we acquire possession of that inheritance. It's something we're looking forward to. We will receive the inheritance. One last passage I want you to, to check out is 1 Peter chapter 1. Gives a little bit more detail. First Peter 1, verse, starting in verse 3, he's talking about having a hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Well, let's start at the beginning of that verse uh, sentence there. 
according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope. This is what we're going to talk about next week. Uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Our inheritance is waiting for us in heaven. It can't be defiled. The promised land that the Israelites received, it was their inheritance, but it did get defiled, right? All kinds of evil uh, idol worship going on, children's sacrifices going on. It could get defiled. Um, but we have an inheritance waiting for us that cannot be defiled. It's unfading. It's kept in heaven for us. And someday heaven and earth will be made one. So all I'm trying to get us to see is as we look at Deuteronomy 8.1, and we see this promise, if you keep all the commandments of God, then you will live and multiply and go in and possess the land that we should see, okay, God does have a possession for us. He does have an inheritance for us. We're waiting for it. So we do our part now. We're, we're kind, we're kind of like the Israelites in the wilderness, sojourning, waiting to take possession of it. We have a possession waiting for us. We've just got to remain faithful to obey all that God has commanded us until that time comes. So he's, so I, I realize this might be, maybe it feels a little scattered to some of you or, or you're, it's going over your head, but just I've been praying this week that we would understand it and trust that it will land with those who it needs to land with and God will teach us. And maybe it's a foggy in your head now. It'll come more clarity as you keep, continue spending time in God's word. But just pray and think about it. And so he said, uh, you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. This is the time that we're in now. We haven't received the inheritance. We shouldn't expect it until it's waiting for us in heaven. So that's where we got to start expecting it, when heaven and earth become one. But uh, why did God do this? Why did God humble them? Look at what the, the actions that God did in this verse. He humbled them and he fed them. He let them go hungry so that he could feed them special food from heaven right? So that they would be receptive to that. So they would see, we need God. And uh, why did he do this? It says in verse 3, and this is just the first part of verse 3, and he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes to the mouth of God. So here's... Uh, Here's this, he humbled you, and he let you hunger. And then he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. He did this so that he could teach them something. He, they needed the humbling so they could learn. They needed to go hungry so they could receive the bread from heaven. And this is, how God, this is something we can learn about God, the way God works. He wanted them to learn that man does not live by bread alone. Man does not live by worldly means alone. We need something more. We need something bigger, uh, something more real. Man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And this is the very passage that Jesus quoted. And, went, and this is another example of taking, letting the New Testament or letting the Bible interpret the Bible for us and explain it to us. Here, the children of Israel are waiting to go into the promised land. They've been tested. Their parents died in the wilderness, and now they're going in, and, and, and Moses is warning them, saying, you can go take possession of the land, but you've got to do all that God wants you to do. It's not your righteousness that gives it to you. It's God's promise that gives it to you, but you've got to do all that God wants you to do, or else it'll get, it'll get, it'll get defiled. It'll get ruined. And Jesus, he was being tempted with sin. The devil was tempting Jesus, and he goes to this passage. So Jesus shows us, all right, what is the use of this passage? What is God truly teaching in this passage in Deuteronomy 3? Uh, Jesus could relate to this passage. When, he, when you think, This is in Matthew 4. The devil came and tempted Jesus, and Jesus was fasting for 40 days in the wilderness. And the devil said, why don't you turn that that stone into bread and eat it because you're hungry because you haven't eaten for 40 days. And Jesus said, man does not live 
by bread alone, but by every word that comes to the mouth of God. It, it popped out of his mouth. As soon as the sin, the temptation came out of Satan's mouth, the word of God came out of Jesus' mouth. So he must have been thinking about this. And he could relate because uh, we, we see that the Israelites were led into the wilderness. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. Uh, the Israelites were, were tested. Jesus was tested by the devil. Jesus was humbled, right? He, he, was, he was up in the highest heavens with all the glory of God, and he became the infant of a poor family. And he had nowhere to lay his head. He was humbled. He was humbled enough that Satan could dare come up to him and say, if you really are the Son of God, then do this. Imagine the humbling that Jesus felt. Jesus hungered because he hadn't eaten for 40 days, being led by the Spirit to do this. Jesus could relate to this in every way. Why, why did Jesus receive all this humbling and all this teaching and all this testing? There was a greater task that laid ahead of him. Three years later, Jesus wouldn't be in a wilderness hungry. He would be on a cross, thirsty, right? saying, I thirst. And he needed to go through this as preparation and God's plan. And Jesus's, in his foreknowledge, he knew this is what it was for. Prepare him for the ministry that lay ahead of him. And so we, we want to learn from Jesus and say, all right, he accepted the wilderness that he was in. And he relied on God's word from Deuteronomy 8, Moses' instructions to carry him through that time because there was something that laid ahead that he needed to receive the humbling receive the testing, and pass that test perfectly. But he learned reliance on God and reliance on the Holy Spirit. We, too, need to learn that lesson because something is lying ahead of us. We don't know what it is. We can't see it. I don't know what God has for his people, the church. But we've, we can't fight tooth and nail to get out of the testing and out of the wilderness that God may be sending us into. Because if he's sending us there, it's for the good that we'll be able to succeed in later on. Whenever Jesus was in that wilderness, the te- what was the temptation that Jesus was ge- uh, that Satan was giving him? Uh, Jesus or Satan, he said, "All right, here you are in the wilderness, surrounded by rocks, colorless rocks. So let's, let's change this wilderness into a bakery." Let's make these beautiful, delicious, nurturing bread. Isn't that good? Don't you have a right to eat food? You left the highest throne in heaven, and you never needed any kind of food to eat. Self-sustaining. And you became flesh and blood. You need food to eat. Don't you have a right to it? Why is God telling you don't eat it? Make yourself some bread. Change this situation. Get yourself out of the wilderness. Make it a better living space for yourself. And I think we can be tempted with that as well. Now, it's a, it's a fine line, and there's, there's some grayness to it, because we do want to make the world a better place, right? We, we have the beast feast, because we want to give people food, right? We don't just say, oh, no, we're just going to persevere until heaven, until heaven comes to earth. We do want to help people, but we need to be walking with God living in God's word in such a way that when the wilderness testing comes to us, we're not frantically trying to get out of it, but realize, all right, this is a testing from God, and he's preparing us for something in the future that will be a blessing to more people. Uh, there's a, there was a minister from the 18th century, John Berridge, and he said, a Christian never falls asleep in the fire. All right, talking about persecution. A Christian never falls asleep in the fire, but he will grow drowsy in the meantime, right? Until you're thrown into the, tr- to the trial, until you're thrown into the flames, you can grow drowsy. He says, we scarcely know how to turn our backs on admiration, though it comes from the sinful world. Yet a kick from the world does a believer less harm than a kiss. And I think sometimes God leads us into the wilderness, this testing that the Israelites had, that Jesus had, 
identifying as a sojourner, not yet receiving the good things from the Lord, but being tested by God and passing that test. These are all aspects of God saying, don't get too comfortable here. Sometimes as the world kisses us and we get admiration from the world, from our society, we say, this is nice. Let's make more of this. But God, said, God in his graciousness will allow us to get a kick from the world. So we don't forget, now this isn't the place for us. They are against us. Uh, they are against the light. The sinful world is not for God and for his ways. So it's not for us. We are persevering. We are sojourners in this world, in this country, until Christ returns. And we want to be a blessing to others. We want to do the things that can, can make uh, to, that can show God's graciousness and love to people, yes. But let's, let's not get too enamored with the kisses of the world. Let's receive God's humbling if it comes and when it comes and say, all right, here's a kick from the world. That's better than a kiss from the world because now I know this isn't my place. I am a sojourner going to a better place. I think this passage is going to require more meditation than what I just shared. And... Uh, I encourage you to do that and pray about it and think about it. The way, what I have found from God's word, when I turn to God's word and I, I learn something from it, when I encourage you guys to pray about it, meditate on it, it's not that I'm saying, okay, so then this time next week you'll get it. Maybe it's something that just stays in your mind and you chew on it for the rest of the year. Or maybe it, you, you work on it for a while and then you put it, put it to the side and then a testing comes, and then it's, oh, yeah, this is what that was talking about. So, so just be patient as God, God's word works in our hearts and teaches us God's perspective of things. Uh, try to satur saturate yourself in God's word so that the, the more you have of God's word in your heart and your mind, the easier it is for the Holy Spirit just to, to reference these, these Bible passages against one another so you can let the Bible interpret itself. Let's go ahead and stand together and we'll sing a hymn. I believe it's Trust and Obey. Was that the hymn? Yes. Let me, let me start with a word of prayer and then we'll sing together.